Good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 12th day of April. It is day 102 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name's Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what it does and point the way to direct our hearts to the one who is the word of life. And so we come to him from all around the world. We gather here to warm ourselves by the fires of his love. For God is love. And today we are in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13. That's where we'll start. Then we go on to 1 Chronicles chapters 2 and 3. And we'll finish in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the word of the Lord. 1 Samuel 13. Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for 42 years. Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent the rest of the men home. He took 2,000 of the chosen men with him to Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, The other 1,000 went with Saul's son Jonathan to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of Philistines at Geba. The news spread quickly among the Philistines, so Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Hebrews, hear this! Rise up in revolt! All Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba, and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. They camped at Michmash, east of Beth-Avon. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in the caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns, Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier. But Samuel didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet him and welcome him, but Samuel said, What is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would, and the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, The Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Samuel then left Gilgal and went on his way. But the rest of the troops went with Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Then Saul counted the men who were still with him. He found only six hundred were left. Saul and Jonathan and the troops with him were staying at Geba in the land of Benjamin. The Philistines set up their camp at Michmash. Three raiding parties soon left the camp of the Philistines. One went north toward Oprah in the land of Shual. Another went west to Beth Horon and the third moved toward the border above the valley of Zeboim, near the wilderness. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to the Philistine blacksmith. The charges were as follows, a quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or a pick, and an eighth of an ounce for sharpening an axe or making the point of an ox goad. So on the day of the battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear, except Saul and Jonathan. The pass at Michmash had meanwhile been secured by a contingent of the Philistine army. 
First Chronicles 2. The sons of Israel were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Judah had three sons from Bethshua, a Canaanite woman. Their names were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. But the Lord saw that the oldest son Ur was a wicked man, so he killed him. Later Judah had twin sons from Tamar, his widowed daughter-in-law. Their names were Perez and Zerah. So Judah had five sons in all. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Zerah were Zimri, Ethan, Iman, Kolkal, and Darda, five in all. The sons of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, was Achan, who brought disaster upon Israel by taking plunder that had been set apart for the Lord. The son of Ethan was Azariah. The sons of Hezron were Jerahamil, Ram, and Caleb. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nahashon, a leader of Judah. Nahashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse's first son was Eliab. His second son was Abinadab. His third, Shemaiah. His fourth was Nathanel. His fifth was Radai. His sixth was Osam. And his seventh was David. Their sisters were named Zariah and Abigail. Zariah had three sons named Abishiah, Joab, and Asahel. Abigail married a man named Jether, an Ishmaelite, and they had a son named Amasa. Hezron's son Caleb had sons with his wife Azubah, and from Jerioth, her sons were named Jesher, Shobab, and Arden. After Azubah died, Caleb married Ephratha, and they had a son named Hur. Hur was the father of Uri. Uri was the father of Bazalel. When Hezron was sixty years old, he married Gilead's sister, the daughter of Machir. They had a son named Segub. Segub was the father of Jair, who ruled twenty-three towns in the land of Gilead. But Geshur and Aram captured the towns of Jair and also took Kanath and its sixty surrounding villages. All these were descendants of Machir, the father of Gilead. Soon after Hezron died in the town of Caleb Ephrathah, his wife Abijah gave birth to a son named Ashur, the father of Tekoa. The sons of Jerahamil, the oldest son of Hezron, were Ram, the firstborn, Banua, Oren, Ozem, and Ahijah. Jerahamil had a second wife named Atara. She was the mother of Onam. The sons of Ram, the oldest son of Jerahamil, were Maaz, Jamin, and Eker. The sons of Onam were Shemaiah and Jeda. The sons of Shemaiah were Nadab and Abishur. The sons of Abishur and his wife Abihel were Ahaban and Molid. The sons of Nadab were Seled and Apem. Seled died without children, but Apem had a son named Ishi. The son of Ishi was Shishan. Shishan had a descendant named Ahalai. The sons of Jeda, Shemaiah's brother, were Jether and Jonathan, Jether died without children, but Jonathan had two sons named Peleth and Zaza. These were all descendants of Jerahamil. Shishan had no sons, though he did have daughters. He also had an Egyptian servant named Jerah. Shishan gave one of his daughters to be the wife of Jerah, and they had a son named Atai. Atai was the father of Nathan. Nathan was the father of Zadab. Zadab was the father of Aphalal. Aphalal was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jehu, Jehu was the father of Azariah, Azariah was the father of Helez, Helez was the father of Elsia, Elsia was the father of Sismai, Sismai was the father of Shalom, Shalom was the father of Jechemiah, Jechemiah was the father of Elishima. The descendants of Caleb, the brother of Jerahmeel, included Misha, the firstborn who became the father of Ziph. Caleb's descendants also included the sons of Mersha, the father of Hebron. The sons of Hebron were Korah, Tapua, Rakem, and Shema. Shema was the father of Raham. Raham was the father of Jorkim. Rikim was the father of Shemaiah. The son of Shemaiah was Maon. Maon was the father of Bet-Zuar. Caleb's concubine Epha gave birth to Haran, Moza, and Gazaz. Haran was the father of Gazaz. The sons of Jahadai were Regem, Jotan, Geshan, Pelet, Epha, and Shaphah. 
another of Caleb's concubines, Makkah, gave birth to Sheber and Tirhana. She gave birth to Shehfa, the father of Matnan, and Sheva, the father of Machbanah and Gibeah. Caleb also had a daughter named Aksa. These were all descendants of Caleb. The sons of Hur, the oldest of Caleb's wife, Ephrathah, were Shobo, the founder of Kiriath Jarim, Salma, the father of Bethlehem, and Heraph, the father of Bet Geder. The descendants of Shobal, the founder of Kiriath Jarim, were Horea, half of the Mithunites, and the families of Kiriath Jarim, the Ithrahites, Puthites, Shumathites, and Mishtharites, from whom came the people of Zorah and Eshtawal. The descendants of Salma were the people of Bethlehem, the Natophites, Atroth Beth Joab, and the other half of the Manahathites, the Zorites, and the families of scribes living in Jebez, the Tirthites. Shimeathites and Sukathites, all these were Kenites, who descended from Hamath, the father of the family of Rakab. 1 Corinthians 3 These were the sons of David who were born in Hebron. The oldest was Amnon, whose mother was Ahinoam from Jezreel. The second was Daniel, whose mother was Abihel from Carmel. The third was Absalom, whose mother was Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. The fourth was Adonijah, whose mother was Higith. The fifth was Shaphatiah, whose mother was Abital. The sixth was Ithrim, whose mother was Egla, David's wife. These six sons were born to David in Hebron, where he reigned seven and a half years. Then David reigned another thirty-three years in Jerusalem. The sons born to David in Jerusalem included Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. Their mother was Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. David also had nine other sons, Abihar, Elishua, Elepelet, Noga, Nepheg, Japhiah, Elishima, Elida, and Elephelet. These were the sons of David, not including his sons born to his concubines. Their sister was named Tamar. The descendants of Solomon were Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Azariah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah. The sons of Josiah were Johanan, the oldest, Jehoiakim, the second, Jedekiah the third, and Jehoahaz the fourth. The descendants of Jehoiakim were his sons Jehoiachin and his brother Zedekiah. The sons of Jehoiachin, who was taken prisoner by the Babylonians, were Sheltil, Malkiram, Pedahiah, Shanazar, Jakamiah, Hoshama, and Nedabiah. The sons of Pedadiah were Zerubbabel and Shemaiah. The sons of Zerubbabel were Melshulam, and Hananiah, their sister, was Shelomith. His five other sons were Heshobab, Ohel, Berkiah, Hasadiah, and Jeshab Hesed. The sons of Hananiah were Peltiah and Jeshiah. Jeshiah's sons were Raphiah. Raphiah's son was Arnon. Arnon's son was Obadiah. Obadiah's son was Shechaniah. The descendants of Shechaniah were Shemaiah, and his sons Hattush, Egal, Beriah, Neriah and Shaphat, six in all. The sons of Neriah were Eloniah, Hezekiah, and Ascriam, three in all. The sons of Eloniah were Hadoviah, Eliashib, Peliah, Achub, Johanan, Deliah, and Anani, seven in all. Second Corinthians 12 This boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven fourteen years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about. But I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, 
So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You've made me act like a fool. You ought to be writing commendations for me, for I am not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing at all. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle, for I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in the other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. Please forgive me for this wrong. Now I am coming to you for a third time, and I won't be a burden to you. I don't want what you have. I want you. After all, children don't provide for their parents. Rather, parents provide for their children. I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. Some of you admit that I was not a burden to you, but others still think I was sneaky and took advantage of you by trickery. But how? Did any of the men I sent to you take advantage of you? When I urged Titus to visit you and I sent other brothers with him, did Titus take advantage of you? No, for we have the same spirit and walk in each other's steps, doing things the same way. Perhaps you think we're saying these things just to defend ourselves. No, we tell you this as Christ's servants, and with God as our witness, everything we do, dear friends, is to strengthen you. For I am afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find, and you won't like my response. I'm afraid that I'll find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. Yes, I'm afraid that when I come again, God will humble me in your presence, and I'll be grieved because many of you have not given up your old sins. You have not repented of your impurity, sexual immorality, and eagerness for lustful pleasure. And now may our Lord... Give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. What do you really want? Is it comfort, security, pleasure, recognition? Maybe it's something related to your family. Maybe you want healing for a child or a spouse for yourself. Paul wanted something too. He wanted it badly. He pleaded for it. He wanted this thing that was bothering him to stop. He called it his thorn in the flesh. And the origins of this thing came from Satan himself, we're told. We're not exactly sure what it was, but the description seems to cover all the bases. We all have needs, physical and spiritual needs, and we all end up crying out to God, asking him to deliver us to take that thing, to correct that thing, to heal that thing, whatever that thing is. And we see that Paul was no different. He pleaded and pleaded and continued to plead. Whatever it was, Paul felt that it was holding him back. This is what Paul really wanted. He saw God delivering and providing and doing miracles that were both spiritual and physical for others. Why didn't God do the same for Paul? Why doesn't he do the same thing for you, for me? Maybe it's because there's something Paul and you and I need that's more important than what we want. Paul needed to know the power of grace in his life. God tells Paul, not once, but three times, grace is what you need. My grace is perfected in your weakness. And so Paul began to treasure even his weaknesses because they became a doorway to the grace, the presence, the love of God. Maybe there's something that we need that's more important than what we want. And the prayer of my own soul today is that I will have the wisdom, the courage, the grace to receive it. 
And that's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife and my daughters and my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Let's continue now in a time of prayer. Feel free to read along with these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast and meditate on these words that are being spoken over you, your family, and our world. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, I hope that you were blessed today by our time in the scriptures and in prayer. I hope that your heart was encouraged. I hope that your eyes were opened perhaps just a little bit more to the wonders of God's love and his presence in your life. Because he is present and he is a loving father. First and foremost, Jesus instructs us very clearly, telling us God is father. He's the father of all, and he is yours, my friend, and you are his. Well, friends, before I let y'all go today, I just want to say thank you to our partners. I'm so appreciative that we have amazing people who've come alongside the podcast and have given so that we might in turn give from the scriptures a treasure indeed. Well, friends, you are a treasure of this community, and I'm grateful. For each and every one of you, but I do want to send a shout out to Abigail Kimsey, Laura Williams, Mary Stonebeck, Jana Engel, Karen McBride, Richard Ludwig, and Fran and Tom Clausen. Thank you so much for being a part of the team, for being a part of the mission, for giving so that we might give in return. And if you're listening today and you would like to join that team of folks, man, that is so amazing. All you need to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com. There you'll find a link where you can click on to give. 
You can find that same link right in the show notes of today's podcast. And if you prefer to do things through the U.S. Post, you can reach us at Daily Radio Bible 2748 Northeast Molini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon 97124. Well, hey, friends, I hope that this day will be a blessing to you. I hope that this day you will find the peace that you long for. I hope that this day your heart will be opened just a little bit more to the healing power of God, that his love will find its way deeper into your soul, into your mind and heart, and that you will take that next step into a new day, into his life. That's the prayer that I have for all of us. What do you say we show up again tomorrow? That's my plan. Until then, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.